Thank you, Talia, for that wonderful introduction. I knew you would make a good speech. I I know her for a few years now. I'm Sixteen. <laughs> And as you heard, my name is Agnes Burris, and I'm a survivor, but I was a very little girl during the Holocaust. And people used to tell me, um, how come you remember? Well, when I go to schools, I always ask the students, well, what do you remember when you were four years old? And usually they say, oh, well, I... I had a baby sister born and I was very unhappy, okay? Some of them would say that, ah, oh, I got my first bicycle. So, what happens is that when you are four, I'll take it up. Well, um, ooh. Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, um, four-year-olds, many of them don't have memories, but uh, I have come to the conclusion that if something significant happened at that age, then we remember. And that's what happened to me. It was very significant. I was born in 1940 in Budapest, Hungary, and I come from a modern Orthodox family um, that was very wealthy. And I didn't have any special needs as a three-year-old before the Holocaust. Actually, the Holocaust did not come to Hungary until March 19th, 1944, which is a date that anybody who was there at the time, just like we remember 9-11, all people who were there remember March 19, 1944. Of course, I don't really remember that particular date uh, because four-year-olds don't really know about dates. I know it was a Sunday, but I don't know, you know, okay, March 19. Well, this happened overnight. The Hungarians were uh, allies of the Germans. So it was uh, a regular government, not, not a German, um, German assisted government, but um, the head of the government, Horty, who was an anti-Semite, but um, he did not allow the deportation of the Jews. However, men between the ages of 16 and I think 55 because my grandfathers were also um, deported or uh, I should say taken for slave labor and uh, it was not a wonderful slave labor because these people, whether they were doctors, lawyers, um, <coughs> shoemakers, whatever they were, they had to follow the Hungarian army to wherever the Hungarian army was uh, fighting like, uh, for instance, the Ukraine. And uh, the problem was that they didn't have, they didn't get uniforms, they didn't get uh, uh, food, only half the rations. And if their commanding officer was a sadist, they had no chance of surviving. If it was a normal person who um, was um, caring about people, then the Jewish person had a chance to survive. Now, 1944, I told you, uh, is when the Holocaust really came to Hungary. And uh, that's when the misery started for 800,000 Jews in Hungary. Now, before that, the Allies were bombing Budapest. And the reason they bombed Budapest because in that city, there was the largest uh, industrial complex that was able to uh, produce war material, by the way, owned by the Jew by the name of Weiss, um, who, by the way, he did something that no one ever did before him. Uh, he negotiated uh, 
with uh, Himmler, and he told him he can have the complex if he lets 32 members of his Jewish family go outside of Hungary. And so his family was saved. That was very unusual because the Germans just uh, went in and uh, took everything. But in his case, I don't know how he did it, but he did it. Anyway, they were bombing. The Allies were bombing. And of course, there were no smart bombs, so they were bombing the whole city of Budapest. And uh, my parents thought that it would be much better if my sister and myself with my mother would go and stay with family in the countryside. And uh, we did go. They had vineyards. And uh, why would they bomb the vineyards? So it was pretty safe for us. But then when March 19 happened, then every Jew had to wear a yellow star by April 5th of that year. And uh, I didn't have to wear a yellow star because I was under the age of six, and it was only for people who were over six years old. So we're down there, and my dad was still up in Budapest, and I don't know how he came down to get us because at this point in time, Jews were not allowed to use any public transportation. But he appeared and he said to my mother, you know, you better come back to the city because there are a million people living in Budapest and uh, anybody could hide. But in a little town like this, everybody knows who's a Jew. So it's safer to go to Budapest, back to our house. And so uh, he had the tickets, he had everything, and we went to the railroad station, which I remember very well because it was total pandemonium because everybody wanted to go to one place and another family wanted to go to another place, and mostly they were peasants, you know, the peasant women with the hundred skirts or whatever they had. The more skirts you had, the richer you were. Anyway, and they had their kids there, and uh, also uh, their animals, and ducks and geese and chicken were flying all over. So it was a total pandemonium. Anyway, the train comes in, and uh, my parents are trying to get on the train with us. No way. They're pushing us off. So it did not take a genius to figure it out. It was because of the yellow star. Both mother and dad were wearing the yellow star because if you were a Jew and if you didn't wear it, they could just summarily really execute you there. So they're wearing this yellow star, which had to be um, four inches in diameter and certain yellow, and you always have to wear it on your outer garment. So they figured it out that they have to hide the yellow star. So. My father picked me up, my mother picked up my sister, and covered the yellow star. We got on the train and chugging along to Budapest, and either myself or my sister moved. And they noticed the yellow star. You know what they wanted to do? They wanted to throw us off the moving train. And there were Hungarian soldiers who were supposed to protect the people on the train, but they were with the crowds. They were going to throw us off the train. And then from another car came some other soldiers. I don't know uh, what uh, nationality they were, because even today I probably would not be able to tell from, from the insignia. So they got into a fight, because the other people have told the Hungarians, what kind of animals are you? Why are you trying to throw, out, <coughs> throw down from the train little kids? So a fight started which I remember because they were rolling on the floor and with the <coughs> weapons and everything that they had with them. And my dad said, let's get out of here. It doesn't matter who wins. The Jew always loses. And he said, we have to go to the last car because the last couple of weeks, any Jew who was found even in the vicinity <clears throat> of the large, larger yellow, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> the larger uh, uh, station next to Budapest, you know, the train station, they were picked up and never heard from again. So he said to mom, you know what, before the train gets into the station, 
it slows down considerably, and we're just going to have to jump. Mom thought it was a crazy idea, but nevertheless, the train did slow down, and Dad jumped, and Mom threw me to him, then threw my sister Suzanne, and then she jumped. Now, I have no recollection how we got home, but once we got home, I was told, well, your name is changing. I was called Agnes Margaret Katz, which is very Jewish. Not the Agnes Margaret, but the Katz. Anyway, so they told me, from now on, you never tell anybody your real name because you could get killed. Now, you know, when you're four years old, what does it mean to be killed? Nothing. Not really. Because uh, you don't ever come across dead people when you're four, except I did later. Anyway, so I was told I am Agnes Kovacs, and I am not Jewish, I am Protestant. And uh, I had to learn all the little prayers that a four-year-old Protestant little girl would know. And Mom said that I was a very good student, I learned it immediately. And I should tell people when they ask where my father is that um, he is a lieutenant on the front fighting for the glory of Germany and Hungary. I still remember it. Anyway, so it was like really, not beaten into me, but they made sure that I will remember. And then one day, a lady came, I never saw her before, and she picked up my little sister, Suzanne, who was less than two years old at the time, and she took her away. And me, you know, I'm this little four-year-old, I don't ask any questions. I didn't know where they took her. <coughs> two weeks later, the lady came for me. And uh, she said to me, now you, don't say a word, do not cry, do not scream, and she tells my mother, and do not follow us, and please don't cry, because no one should know what's happening here, because maybe one of your neighbors would go to the authorities saying that, well, something is going on there. So, she takes me to the tram stop, and I see my mother, she is following us, even though she was told not to, and I saw that she was crying, and, of course, the lady didn't see it because she was carrying me and I could see back there, but she couldn't. And then the tram came and we got on the tram. And as the tram was going further and further away, I was still looking at my mother and she was getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then she disappeared. And then I broke into crying. I was hysterical. I've never been away from my parents. And I didn't know where I was going, what's happening. Nothing was explained to me. I was devastated. We got to the place where this woman lived. By the way, she was really a uh, righteous Christian, and we will find out in a minute why. So, we arrived there. It's not really a house, it's some sort of shack with uh, packed dirt floors, and uh, well, there was electricity, but no running water, no toilets, so it was a shack. My sister was already there, and she was so happy to see me, and so it was okay. The lady was a very nice lady, and uh, there wasn't much food, but my father's friend, uh, whom uh, he became friends with, during university time, and uh, this friend became a colonel <coughs> in the Hungarian army, and you know, he has still had his uniform, and uh, he could uh, press, I mean, pass any uh, uh, <coughs> police uh, uh, who were uh, looking for Jewish people, and of course he wasn't Jewish, and he had the uniform, so he could he could come and uh, bring us some food, whatever he could find. So, every week he brought something. And then, one day, the shack was demolished, 
by a bomb. And she um, sent word, the lady sent word to my parents that she can no longer take care of us. So my parents sent uh, the uh, colonel because he could go through any checkpoints. And uh, he did come. And even though Mrs. Konus was the name of the lady, I'll remember it until I die. Anyway, uh, she said to him, uh uh. I told the parents of these children that I will never, ever give them to anybody else but to them. So, even though she knew this man, this man came every week with food or something, she would come with us. How is that for a righteous Christian? And, as we were walking, this was a dusty suburb, it was a very low-class area, and we were walking, on, uh, on the street itself, and all of a sudden, there come, comes a Arrow Cross guy. Arrow Cross were the Hungarian Nazis. And they are called Arrow Cross because their insignia was two arrows crossing. So, they tell us, everybody go on the sidewalk. Nobody on the street. And then I see, <coughs> that they have whips, and they were whipping men, women, and children, and pushing them with the butts of their rifles. And, you know, I'm just watching this. I'm standing on the corner, and, and the, uh, I'm being told that I'm supposed to be finishing, and I'm not even further away, but <laughs> anyway. So, and, uh, the people who were standing on the sidewalk, you know what they did? They were yelling, stinking Jews, drop dead, and all sorts of lovely epithets like that. And then I'm standing there on the corner and I'm thinking, aha, uh -huh, this is what it means to be a Jew. This is why I can't tell anybody my real name. Well, this is only the beginning of my story, but I'm, I understand that I have to give it. They want me to finish it? Yes, they want to break it. Just go. I'm just so wild. What? Yeah. Sorry about that. The more interesting part of my story is finished. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. And uh, the whole biological family. And everybody else who's associated with her. Um, for those, just so you know, if you haven't read the rest of the story, and w without all the details, I'm sure Agnes in a speech can grab your, your guts, that was awful, uh, can get you emotionally involved, uh, on the placards in the back are, there's more of Agnes's story, it's really, really so worthwhile for everyone to, to read. Uh, How do I start? What do I say? How, how do I deserve that? When we, were, when we were liberated, we saw this is the end of the world. Nobody will look at us because we were called unmenschen. We were called subhuman. And then we realized, look at this room. Look at the support. It is just wonderful, wonderful. I want to thank you for this great honor you still uh, on us. It is a wonderful, wonderful feeling. But I have a message. The message is so much more important. Oh, I have a message to all of you, to all the young people, to the second and to the third, and there are some fourth generation. What, what we have to do. I come from Czechoslovakia. We were occupied in 1939, just Hitler just walked in and the audacity, he went to the castle, opened the window, and he says, uh, this is a protectorat. Who was he protecting us from? Obviously, he meant the Russians. Anyway, from, from one to the other. We go, after the occupation, our life has changed drastically. Every Jew had to wear the Star of David on the front and on the back. Yes, okay, thank you. 
Uh, every man from the age of 18 to 45 was taken, was drafted to slave labor camp. Most of them never returned. We Jewish children could no longer go to school. I met my friend. She said, Judy, why won't you in school? Because I'm Jewish. But you were Jewish yesterday. She could not understand what happened all of a sudden. We were, unfortunately, we have to make, I have a long story, so I have to cut, the, make, make it shorter. Anyway, we were still home. After the occupation, more, uh, predominantly 80, 85, 90% of the Jews were taken from their home, they were put into ghettos, from there they were taken to concentration camps and in the beginning and later to exterminating camps. One morning it was, yes, they confiscate everything. They take everything away from you. You have absolutely no right. The, the, anybody who had a profession, doctor, lawyer, teacher, could no longer work. It was just the most horrible way. But even that ended. In, uh, in, uh, it was a, uh, a day before Passover. There were two SS men and two Hungarian gendarmes knocked on our window. You have a half hour. Take all your money, take all your jewels, and start marching. We lived six kilometers from town. And we, what do you take in a half hour? My father took his prayer shawl. My mother didn't want to go. She says, I don't want them to kill me. I'm going to drink something. We, we persuaded mom not to do that. And we started marching. We, we came, uh, it was an hour walk from, from where we lived. And we were told to go to the Jewish cemetery. And my father said, how convenient. They're going to kill us. They don't even have to bring us to be buried. That didn't happen. After a week at the cemetery, we were taken by a regular train to a town into Hungary called Mate Soko. There were thousands and thousands of people. This was the, uh, the ghetto when they were there prior to that, but we came. We stayed there six weeks, and we were young, the young people, we were helping, we were cleaning the, the ghetto, we were cooking, but we were still together with our parents. That too ended. One morning we were taken to the railroad, and this time we were put into cattle cars, 75 to 80 people in one of the cars, and cramped like, like sardines. They closed it with an iron bar, and we moved the following morning. It was the longest, the most horrible four and a half days. There, there was no air. They gave us an empty boat to use as a bathroom and one filled with water. The children were crying. They want food. They are hungry. But what was thank you? But what was what was the worst? The worst people went crazy. They they were desert. So they started hitting one another and screaming. So the SS said, the SS man said, if that doesn't stop, we will take all of you out and shoot you on the spot. So we had to tie them out and keep them quiet. It was the 21st of May. We arrived to our destination. We don't know where we are. We see men in the striped uniform running back and forth. And we ask them, where are we? What is this? And they say, this is hell. And they're giving us order. Line up row of five, women and men. We tell, there's my mother, my, my sister, my aunt, my niece, and myself, and my aunt's three little children, two, four, and six. There's my father's row. My father, my brother-in-law, my uncle, my nephew, and another man. And they give the orders. The men in the striped uniform are looking at young girls and boys. 14, 13, 18, in every language, 14. 
What do they mean by 14? We found out later. Outcomes, this tall man, very handsome, with the shiny boots. This is Dr. Joseph Mengele. He was called the Angel of Death. And he deserved that name because he was to determine who shall live and who shall die. He came, he came to our row. He pointed to my niece to go to the left, to me to go to the left. We went to the left and they went to their death. When I passed my father's row, he put his hand on my head as he did every Friday night to bless us. He said, Judy, you will live. This was the last time that I saw my family. 24 members of my family were killed that day. <coughs> we came to a room, we had to get undressed completely. We went through the showers. In our case, water was coming down. In, the, my, in, the, in our parents' case, the gas was coming down. We were walking, we are in Auschwitz now. Yes, there is a big sign, Arbeit macht frei, work will liberate you. But that gave us a little bit of hope. So maybe we are taken to, to work, but that did, not, that did not happen. We were walking from Auschwitz to Birkenau, it took one hour. We came to a big barrack there, 1,400 young women were put into a barrack. Within a, a half hour, there is the most horrific smell of burning, like burning hair. It was choking. So we asked the girls that were there before, what is this horrible smell? They said, these are your parents burning. As you went through the shower, they went through the gas chamber and immediately into the crematorium. It was done with such a speed. We were, we were in Auschwitz six weeks. You, the food is hardly any. You get a little bit of black water in the morning and a pot of soup which is made out of turnip and thickened with some bread. Once a week you get a four inch square bread. It's very thin. You could eat it up in a minute, but you hold on to it because you don't know whether there is food the next day. We were there, our group, 2,000 uh, Czechoslovak-born girls, women, young women. The oldest woman might have been not older than 32, and she had to look strong and, and healthy. Then he came and looked at a young girl, and he said, how old are you? If you say 13, you go with the mother. If you say uh, 14, then, and you look healthy, you're being taken to work. Now, he also announced, are there any twins? Step out, you're going to have a much better uh, life. Unfortunately, that was, that was the biggest lie, because right across from our uh, barrack where we were, there was the hospital where Joseph Mengele with another doctor were doing experiments on, on, on twins. That is unbelievable. Anyway, we were there, we were in Auschwitz six weeks. After one day, coming out of the, sh uh, of the shower, we were told to go to the railroad. This time, oh yes, we were given a little blanket. What a, what a treasure. We were taken to West Germany, to the town of Gelsenkirchen. There, half of the 2000 was working outside, building houses, building the roads, building bunkers, very hard work for young women. I was among the ones that worked outside. The others worked for group and they were working in ammunition. Many of us were, you couldn't get, you couldn't be sick longer than two days. If you were sick longer than that, you're being taken away, never to be seen again. We, after many, many months, we were told to go and to, a, to the next town. This time we were taken to Essen. 
Then I worked, my group worked inside and the others out. What happened to me, a piece of iron fell on my wrist and it broke. If you, if you cannot work, you're being taken away. I said goodbye to my niece and waited. In the middle of the night, somebody taps me on the shoulder. It's Essence woman, Erica. Come to Klein. She called me little one. She took me to the hospital and they put on a cast. What do I need a cast? Don't ask questions. And the way she tells the foreman, I need this girl because she speaks so many languages. And if the Czech girl, the Polish girl, the Russian girl, the Hungarian girl doesn't speak German, doesn't understand, she wouldn't know what to do. He gave her the letter and I was saved. We were working very hard. We were getting skinnier and dying from hunger. The hunger, no human being should experience hunger. You just stop thinking of anything. But then we were told to go on the death march. But that was literally a death march. In what way? If there was a mother and daughter and one could no longer walk, we had to drag the one that still could walk, hoping that we could save her life. We had to walk, it was almost three weeks, if I remember correctly. We finally arrived in Bergen-Belsen. Anybody that survived the camp of Bergen-Belsen will live forever. Mountains and mountains of dead bodies. My niece is already joined us, and she said, Judy, I am dying. If I could only have a morsel of food. The SS woman announced, if, you, if one of you can go, and two of us could carry the bodies to the mayor's grave, you're going to earn a bowl of soup. We did that. I found another girl. Ida was not capable to do anymore. She, hadn't, she was so weak. So we, we got a bowl of soup. We divided it in three, and, and we were, I, I was able to continue. Anyway, now, in a beautiful, beautiful day, 1945, in April, of April 15, in fact, we saw soldiers in a different uniform. We were liberated by the British. It was the most wonderful words to hear, you are free. We were all very sick. There was typhoid and TB, all kind of sickness. It took one whole year for me to be cured after the camp. My, my, when I woke up in the hospital, my niece was alive, which was a wonderful, wonderful thing. Anyway, it is, we, unfortunately, it is a very sad way what we all truly will, the second generation, they will talk about their, their parents. And it is so extremely important. But we have, I have a, a real request to you all young and very young, and Jews and non-Jews. We have to see that such things should never happen again. What just, I just got an email, what happened in, what happened in, in Scandinavia. They were always very favorable to, to the Jewish people. Unfortunately, what happened on, last week on the 7th, they were the Jewish families in all in Denmark and Norway and in Sweden, the Jewish people found uh, the Star of David written Jude and uh, on their on their mailbox. They, the anti-Semitism is in, uh, unfortunately growing, and we have to do something about it, and we can do it because unfortunately, my father was one of them. He said Hitler will never reach it. He will never achieve it because I was in the army before in the First World War. It is here. England and America will win the war. But it, he did, he, he was doing very well. Unfortunately, you must not forget it. It's got to be done now as much as we can. I wish I knew the 
how to do it, but I know there will be a way. We have this country of ours, unfortunately, we have some of it as well here, and we have to take it serious. And I thank you all very, very much. And we have awards. How can you not have awards for these lovely ladies? <laughs> so, here we have for Agnes Katz Verdes. Thank you very much. Judy Alpin's award. And thank you, Judy, so much to, as a gift for, to us all. Thank you very much.